For future children. Good evening. Boy, this is wonderful. Fabi, can you hear me? Oh, good. That's about as loud as I can get unless I whistle. And I used to work on a waterfront, so you don't want me to do that. Um, I'm Elizabeth Silver. I'm chair of the Northampton Democratic City Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight, and I'd like to thank um, all of you for coming despite this crazy weather. Um, I first wanted to thank and introduce the folks that are here with us tonight, Representative Peter Cocott. Thank you for coming. <laughs> to be here, some of whom had planned to be there, here and at the last minute for a variety of reasons could not be here, Stan Rosenberg, John Seibach, Ellen Story, and Steve Kulik. So um, they do send their regrets um, and they are very sorry they can't be here. Um, when I am done welcoming you with a very brief background, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Pam Schwartz who's going to give you an agenda for tonight. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, the Northampton Democratic City Committee Executive Committee met and we were talking about the budget that the governor proposed and what we could do to get information out about it and respond to it and then we met with the Yes Northampton folks and this is the result of those discussions and meetings. Um, we know that there have been significant changes to the state tax code. The net effect has been a loss to the state of $3.8 billion in annual tax revenue for the Commonwealth. And um, in the last 10 years, that's meant a state aid cut to Northampton of $4 million. So we're facing a very difficult time. We can't expect services unless we have some revenue to back them up. And so we're here tonight to try to figure out how to make that happen. So thank you all again for coming, and we'll try to move this along. Okay, so good evening. I'm Pamela Schwartz. I'm, uh, some of you know me as a uh, counselor from Ward 4. Tonight I am here in my um, volunteer capacity as a, a member of Yes Northampton. Um, and I'm going to, first of all, I just want to say it's amazing seeing you here. And, um, and I, I, you know, we set up a cozy circle. Who knew? <laughs> and and it, it's just fantastic that you're here, that you're ready to get involved, and we're ready to partner with you. So um, uh, if you have not done, signed the sign-in sheet, because I realize some people might need to leave at different times, Make sure you get down on that sign, get your name and your email address, the way to stay connected. Um, yes, Northampton has an email list. I don't know if the Democratic City Committee is, but I want to just say we will keep you in the loop of what's happening on this revenue raising front by getting on our email list. I was also asked to say that there, this is being recorded by the North Street Association. Nor, North Street Association. So that's just an FYI what that, that recorder there is there. Um, Thank you. Okay, so our agenda tonight. We're going to hear for a few minutes from a, a fellow Yes Northampton volunteer, Joel Feldman, about um, the little warm background on current legislative proposals. And then we're going to turn it over to our representative who can talk to give, bring us the state perspective, um, you know, what's happening, what he sees happening, what we can do to support what's possibly happening. And then we're going to have discussion. And I realize in a group this size, um, that will be its own challenge, and we will, we will conquer it with the fabulous moderation skills of Jane Fleischman, another member of Yes Northampton. Um, so that will happen for over 20, 25 minutes. We'll just hear from you, have a back and forth with the representative, with the mayor, with you know, what comes up. Um, then we're going to go to a few minutes on next, and really get concrete on our next action steps on how to push forward state tax reform um, and things that are in the works that we'll let you know from an advocacy perspective. And then finally, we will leave uh, a few minutes to touch base on the local side. Um, we know that, you know, I imagine what's brought at least a, a, lot, a number of you out is um, the announcement around the recent budget cuts that are being proposed to the schools. Um, we all are alarmed and uh, committed to stopping them. And, um, and we are going on the state revenue front. Uh, that's what this meeting is about. We will take a few minutes at the end to talk about what happens on the local side for local revenue. Uh, depending on what does or does not, ha not happen on the state side. But that will be the beginning. That, that, the local piece right here tonight, we're just going to start that conversation. We're going to really spend the bulk of, uh, really, the vast majority of our time on how we can generate more revenue from the state. Okay? 
So with that, we will get started. Joel. So um, <clears throat> thinking that there wouldn't be 125 people here, I made 30 <laughs> copies of my handouts. <laughs> so every five people share. Okay. So um, if you feel like you've been involved in this process for the last few years and all that happens is cut, 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 you're right. That is exactly what's happened. And the question is, why are we in this pickle every single year? So I want to talk a little bit on the state side about how we got here. And um, for those of you who don't have the handouts, I'll describe them to you. They're also, let me say, ourbudget.org has all these information. Mass budget. Mass budget. Mass budget. Mass Being a former legislative aide, I actually have extra. Okay. <laughs> We have the most versatile representative in the state. That's all I have to say. Um, so, uh, in 1998, um, a significant changes were made in the income tax and other taxes in Massachusetts that continued over the next number of years. And the most important ones to remember are in 2000, we the people decided to change the tax rate from 5.95% to 5%. Everyone knows we have a flat tax rate. You don't pay a higher rate as your income goes up. Everyone pays the same rate regardless of whether you make a million dollars or whether you make $10,000, okay? So um, the rate was changed from 5.95 to 5%. The legislature actually stepped in and kept it at 5.3%. We're now at 5.25% because of the way the legislation got fixed. Um, so that's one thing to remember. We dropped the income tax rate a bunch of years ago. Second, we dropped the rate applying to dividend and interest income, which almost all goes to the higher income folks from 12% to 5.3%. And we double the value of the personal exemption that if you fill out tax forms, you know you get a personal exemption. Uh, we double that for single filers and married couples. So I'm, I'm not going to get too deep in the income tax weeds now. I'm just going to give you the overview. But know that for every year that that regime has been in place, we lost $2.5 billion. So from 1998, we've had a hole of $2.5 billion that's gone forward every single year to date. Um, there are other factors that happen. There's uh, sales tax moved uh, when there's in more internet purchases, sales tax applied less. I'm not going to get into this, the, the other details because these are the ones that are by far the most important. Um, so as a result of that, uh, annual estate taxes as a share of personal income, that is the amount of taxes we pay versus how much everyone makes, went down 1%, which is an enormous amount if you think of the amount of uh, personal income tax revenue that's generated across the state. And then as a result of that, these are the cuts across the state budget for the last 12 years, um, adjusted for inflation. 28% cut in early education, 38% cut in environmental recreation, 31% cut in higher ed, 46% cut in local aid. So if you feel like there's less money, there is less money, and when you have less money, you can spend less money. It's really kind of as simple as that. And as a result, we have this hole year after year because we don't have the revenue to fund the things we need. And as you know now, we're not looking at cutting the 22 top administrators in the school department because we did that 10 years ago. And now we're cutting teachers. So, or at least that's the proposal. And as, as Pamela said, we're going to try to do everything we can to stop that. But that's, what, that's where we are now. We need revenue. If we had kept the revenue sources at the same level, we'd have $2.5 billion more every year. So the good news on the revenue side is that there are proposals this year to try to fix some of that. And the other, so the first page is just what I described for mass budget. It describes the tax situation over the past bunch of years. The second page, which is another two-pager, has the governor's revenue proposal and um, another proposal that's coming out of the legislature. So let me talk about that for two minutes, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Pamela. The governor this year, for the first time in ages, decided that now is the time to try to increase revenue. And he proposed increasing the personal income tax from 5.25 to 6.25%. I should say nobody really likes higher taxes, right? It's more money that you don't get to spend the way you see fit. On the other hand, if you don't have them, you don't get to pay for teachers. So the notion was, let's try to fix some of the problems we've had before. The other uh, reason why an income tax increases better than almost any other tax is it correlates with income, which correlates with people's ability to pay. So it's a fairer tax than almost any other tax. Sales tax, for example, is one of the most regressive taxes because people with less money spend a much higher percentage of their income on the sales tax than people with a lot more money. 
So the governor's proposal was to increase the personal income tax rate, also to reduce the sales tax rate from 6.25% to 4.5%. Okay, so those are the two major things the governor did. The governor also decided and proposed to eliminate a whole bunch of personal tax exemptions, which I'm not going to get into. Some of those do fall on middle income people. And that's why while the proposal is a step in the right direction, it's not perfect in, our, in the view of Yes Northampton. But it raises significant revenue that the governor wanted to dedicate to transportation and education. So that's the governor's proposal. He's been going around the state. I'm going to let Representative Philcott describe the reaction in the legislature to the governor's proposal. Uh, so that's one proposal that's out there. Another proposal that's out there uh, is one that's called an act to invest in our communities. It was introduced in the legislature last year. And it proposes also to restore the income tax rate, uh, to restore 5.25 to 5.95, what it used to be before the cut. It raises the tax uh, on investors to 8.95% from 5.3%. Uh, uh, and it raises one point, uh, this year it's supposed to raise $1.9 billion in revenue. So that one is, is extremely progressive because it also has exemptions for low and mid middle income people. Uh, to make sure that they're not paying, that, that they're protected somewhat from these increases. Um, and if you look at the second sheet, what's really sort of mind-boggling, I wish I had this on a screen, is that uh, if you take into account all state and local taxes, the poorest people pay the highest percentage of taxes in Massachusetts because of our reliance on things like the property tax and the sales tax. And this would change that to say upper income people should pay more. So that's the proposal that's the more progressive proposal. And those are the ones that are at least on the table. The good news is the discussion has begun, that something has to happen on revenue, and we can't do this year after year and expect the kind of community that we all want. So with that, I'm turning it over to Pamela. Okay, and, I, and thank you. Um, and let me say, um, Representative Cocott is a sponsor of an act to invest in our communities. He's one of the co-sponsors, um, and again, he'll have a lot more to say about that. I also want to say um, that on the governor's side, the governor's proposal um, while it is uh, it's a bold step around raising revenue and um, the investment proposals around transportation education are fantastic, it so happens that the way it's structured, it does not benefit Northampton. Um, it's not, it, it, there's it's a combination of, and I'll let our elected, well, I guess I am an elected official, but I'll let our other elected officials um, talk more about th that if we have more questions about that. But, um, but the, I just want to flag that, that... The, um, while the governor's proposal is very laudable for its aims, it so happens that the way the funding comes down, it, its emphasis on higher education and early education, and it does increase the education funding pot, the Chapter 70 funding, but the way it works, it, it gives, it, the calculation is roughly additional $68,000 to Northampton. So it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate fact of this, of this otherwise very worthy, very, very worthy proposal that it does not address Northampton's revenue shortfall. So I just want to flag that. Um, so with that, and I think at this juncture, Representative Cocott, why don't you share with us your thoughts and experience, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Pam. My name is Peter Cocott. Uh, my family has lived in this town for over 100 years. Um, I went to Florence Grammar School, which was right over here, right over there. Uh, this school, Northampton High School. Um, when you're speaking on the House floor, you have to project because it's a very large room. You have spotlights that shine at you all the time. And all the House members talk all the time. So this, this forum, believe it or not, is not quite so hard as that. Um, let me start by saying I would never vote to raise your taxes unless it was absolutely necessary. I'm a working person, middle class working person. I know the pressures that you are under. So I don't think this is an exercise in ideology. I'm a Democrat, so I'm for taxes. Whenever I, I face an issue, I research it very, very carefully. I talk to a lot of people. Um, by virtue of the fact that I handed out all those handouts, you know that I, I read a lot of stuff that's very technical all the time. And so what I'd like to do is just walk you through some of what we're looking at the facts that I'm seeing and why I think it's important right now to raise substantial new revenues. Um, when we're looking at this issue, you've got the short-term needs, but you really have a long-term need to really overhaul our tax code. 
our tax code um, has tons of exemptions, tons of tax breaks that have happened over years. Some of them are 60 years old. When you look at them, the circumstances that led to these tax breaks being enacted, in some cases, are not meaningful now. In some cases, we should increase them. They target industries that are doing very well in Massachusetts, and we want to keep those businesses here. <coughs> so in looking at ways to look at these tax breaks, and to perhaps garner more revenue from taking away many of them, and to make it more rational and more transparent, the legislature in 2010 passed an outside section establishing a special commission. That special commission met for nine, met on, on, on nine dates, 2011 through last year, that special commission basically found that our system is incredibly complex. And in comparison with other states, we are giving way too much money away. So the participants in that commission met and came up with a series of recommendations. And if you want to access those, go on to mass.gov, DOR's website, Tax Expenditure Special Commission. In summary, what they basically recommend is that administration and finance, the revenue department, and the legislature really start evaluating who gets these tax breaks, what it costs us, <coughs> how we should change them. And in some cases, they actually recommend that many of these tax breaks be sunsetted after five years. There's a category that, that we are looking at right now. So that, that long-term work is happening. The problem with it is it's not going to help us this fiscal year. You're probably a good couple of years out before you'll see meaningful impact from that work. So at the present time, what are we doing to address this shortfall? A couple of things are happening. Senator Rosenberg and I have a bill to establish a graduated tax on income. Our state's constitution does not permit a graduated tax. So right now, when you're trying to tweak that tax code and trying to do it so that the more wealthy taxpayers pay more in taxes based on their income, we have to do it on the sort of the, the more technical aspects of that code. Once again, that bill is not a quick solution. It's not going to help us this year. It takes two years to pass an amendment on the Constitution. That's a couple of years out. So let me just talk about a couple of the facts, and I apologize, my, my, uh, my glasses are at home, so I'm going to hold this out far enough so it looks a little strange, it's just so that I can, I can make sense of it for you. Um, what have we been doing to face this incredible fiscal crisis that's been happening now, I think, for the last four years, that really was of no fault of ours. When you look at the economic impact of the meltdown on Wall Street, the lack of regulation from Congress on those participants in, in that meltdown, I don't think anyone here was part of those meetings. I certainly wasn't. And so we've, we've had to deal with it. And so what was our response? Um, first of all, we engaged in a series of reforms, transportation reform, pension reform, insurance reform, reform of our ethics, campaign finance and lobbying laws, trying to consolidate and save where we could. We've tried to prudently use one-time revenues, stimulus funds. We have been very careful about trying to put money away. We have a stabilization fund that's currently at $1.5 billion which in contrast with most states is, is, is much, much higher. We've tried to vigorously pursue job retention and creation strategies that take advantage of uh, niche um, manufacturing, for instance. If you look at the Westfield, Southampton area, you have a niche manufacturing sort of uh, cluster there of metal tooling where some of the uh, most, most uh, precise parts in the world are being made right now. Um, we've tried to capitalize on that. We've tried to maintain and strengthen our knowledge-based economic system, higher ed, the hospitals, healthcare, green technology, biotech. We've tried to grow job training programs at our community colleges. 
It's probably Senator Rosenberg. Hold on. <laughs> probably, uh, what am I saying? Asking for money. I know, I know. Um, and we've raised revenues. I voted to raise the sales tax. I wasn't happy about that. That, that tax is not progressive. But that was a year that if we didn't raise the sales tax that year, that was a $100 million local aid cut. A large portion of that sales tax increase went to bail out the debt at the MBTA, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So that, that was an important vote. When the arbiters, the, the independent arbiters of our performance, which are Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch's rating services, these are, are the Wall Street rating services that every time we have a bond prospectus, whenever we seek to borrow long-term bond funds, short-term bond funds, they look at our books, they look at how many lawsuits we have, they look at what our revenue streams are and how we are performing. They have consistently said that we faced that financial crisis and did it the right way and have increased our bond rating to AA plus in contrast with most states. What that has done is it has lowered our bond borrowing costs, freeing up funds for, for various programs, local aid included. <coughs> Let me talk about our next steps. So we've been facing this challenge and doing a very good job with what we have. We don't have enough. So now we're looking at the horizon. We're trying to predict what's going to happen. And here are some of the challenges that, that we are facing. The past tax cuts have really, have really hobbled us. If you look at the tax cuts that were enacted up until the year 2001, $3 billion that we would have had right now. We have an extremely high debt load per capita compared to other states. One of the ways that we tried to get out of the crisis in past years was to borrow. The MBTA in Boston in particular is under a huge debt burden right now. The highest transit debt burden in the country. In the year 2000, in an effort to refinance and to consolidate the transportation uh, uh, system in Massachusetts, two large pieces of debt related to the central artery, totaling about $2.6 billion, were transferred to the MBTA. That debt load alone every year costs them about $150 million. Their overall debt costs per year are more than their personnel costs. Let me repeat that. It costs more for them to pay on their credit card every year than they pay in salaries and health insurance. Um, medical costs. If you talk with the mayor of Northampton, he will tell you that his health insurance costs are skyrocketing, notwithstanding the efforts of the Commonwealth to lower health care costs and an effort to actually bring every community into our group health care system in Massachusetts. Congress, we spent a lot of time talking about this, I'm, I'm going to be very, very brief. Congress is dysfunctional right now. It's virtually impossible for them to pass reforms. It's almost impossible for them to actually pass a budget to move us into the next fiscal year. The sequestration amounts that you've seen cut already, you're never going to see that, those, those funds back here. That money is gone. And what we're worried about is that not only will they not reach some sort of a compromise on March 27th, but it's going to get worse. And if that happens, that's $8 billion that comes into this state every year from them. So the question for us is, how do we predict how much of that $8 billion we've got to backfill? And that's money in the schools, job training, transportation, you name it. The labs. You've probably heard about the Hinton lab and the compounding lab out, out in uh, Natick or uh, uh, Framingham. The law enforcement costs, 
and lawsuit costs of those two lab crises, the estimate is between 300 and 500 million to us. Let me repeat that, 300 to 500 million that we're going to have to pay out over the next five years. So, we need more revenue. I am convinced of that. I am going to vote to raise your taxes. If people are not happy with that, I will repeat everything I just said. <laughs> now, what are the plans? What's out there in the mix? What are we looking at? Governor Patrick's plan, $2 billion. He's focusing on transportation, education. Uh, you have handouts about it. Um, that was his sort of first stab at it. That started the conversation. Um, the important part about it is it asks us, asks us to raise revenues and gives a very rational explanation of how he would like that spent. The act to invest in our communities. We have some folks here tonight who are working on that. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Raises approximately $1.9 billion. The goals are a progressive, transparent tax increase. And let me talk a little bit about it. You have groups such as the MTA, Mass Teachers, uh, the Social Workers Union, Teamsters, a wide variety of groups that are working on it. When you look at the co-sponsor list of that bill, you not only find members of the Progressive Caucus, progressive members of the Senate, but folks that you would not identify with those groups. In other words, you have moderate to conservative Democrats sponsoring a tax increase, which is relatively unusual at the State House. Um, then you have other other sort of efforts to raise taxes and raise revenues. Um, so just to make it simple, so sort of over on this side, you have those folks who don't want to do anything, in fact, want their taxes cut. And if you look at, I think it was the election in 2006 or 2004, there was a non-binding referendum on the, uh, on the ballot in some communities. And the question was, would you like to abolish the income tax? And 49% of the voters said yes. So a constant challenge for people in my line of work is to eradicate that disconnect between people who want certain services but really don't want to pay for them. That said, there are people who would like to perhaps pay higher taxes but do, but do not trust what's happening in Boston and don't trust us. But I think we've tried to do a good job in the last eight years through, through reforms, campaign finance, lobbying, all, all the things I already mentioned, to restore trust in us. And as I said, this is a tough, this is a very tough vote. This is a tough vote for every representative and every senator. We don't take these votes lightly. Number two, in the middle of this sort of graph, are those folks who want to do something. And what that has come down to recently is the transportation fix. The debt at the MBTA, moving transportation employees that are currently being paid for by bond funds onto our regular operating funds, and maybe a little increase in Chapter 90 funds, which are the local road projects, and maybe a few roads here, maybe a bridge. And that solution is somewhere around $500 million. Let me tell you what will happen with that solution. If you look at the waiting list for projects in Western Massachusetts, we could do 750 million tomorrow, I think. I think that's, that's the backlog out here. So if it's only 500 million, think about what percentage is gonna end up east of Worcester. Most of it. It's all gonna be in the Boston area. So to really get to our needs, and maybe repaving Ryan Road, and, uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm not really... Juice and dry. Juice and dry. My road's in pretty good shape. But um, to really get to our needs out here, our needs out here, here's an example. I have a, I have a bridge in a community that I'll not, I'm not going to mention. It's not Northampton. Where if you go down to the culvert, on one side of the road, and you look underneath the bridge, 
There's one rock holding up that side of the bridge. Up and over the road, on the other side of the culvert, there's, there's two rocks on that side. The last two storms have totally eroded all the cement out. The town is afraid to tell the state because if they tell them, they're going to shut down the road. And there's only one road into that town. So to get projects like that done and to fix your potholes and to fund your schools out here, that solution that's in the middle, that $500 million solution, doesn't get you anything after we raise fees and the gas tax and do whatever. In fact, one of the parts of that plan is to charge you the number of miles you drive. Now, if you're someone from Western Massachusetts, you're driving a lot more just to get you know milk and bread than somebody living in Somerville. That's not good for us. So, the plan that we're looking at is the one that gets it done. And that plan is going to be some sort of a combination of all the stuff we've been talking about here tonight, the governor's plan, the act. But it all comes down to numbers. Now I'm going to walk you through the numbers. And this is what I do as part of my business. I really know this stuff, and I'm not bragging, it's just that this is what I do. There's 160 members of the House. Three open seats, so you've got 157. 29 are the members of the other party, not my party. You've got 15 conservative Democrats. You've got 53 members that are generally progressive. That's, that's me, and out of that, you've got probably 40 members of the Progressive Caucus. So you've got 60 members of the House of Representatives in play. They really have to be convinced that this is a great idea. Now I'm going to explain a little bit why that's true. We need to get to 90 votes. 90 votes is important because you don't want just a majority. You want to be able to go onto the House floor and have a 10-point cushion, 10-member cushion. So when I go in and talk to the Speaker of the House, he wants to know, how many votes do you have? How many do you have? And those members have to actually go into him and say, I'm with you on this. Because we're not going to bring this out and put it on the floor and have it fail. So the process that we are engaging in right now is to get to that 90 vote. <coughs> okay? Now, 17 members out of that 60 are rookie members. They're new to the House, and they live in conservative districts. These are districts that Senator Scott Brown either did very well in or actually won. Okay. These members have never taken a tax vote ever in their life in the House. So this leaves us 43 members of the House that we've got to talk into the concept that there's not enough revenue to fix your roads, to pay your teachers, to keep enough police on the force, to have enough firefighters there to fight a fire in your house if it happens. 43. Out of this 43, there are 20 members in whose districts Elizabeth Warren did better than Martha Copeland by a significant percentage, by at least 12%. What that means is they are members living in districts that are leaning more progressive over time. So that 23 members is what our group in the House are focusing on right now. Last Tuesday, the, the uh, Progressive Caucus met with the Speaker of the House, Bob DeLeo. He's a great guy. He's a great guy because he actually has, you know, really championed some great liberal causes, mental health care, early education, job training. We all went in. He talked about the fact that he had members coming in telling him that, geez, you know, I really don't want to 
have to have a tax vote. So we explained our position, and he said, you need to help me get those votes. So that's the process that's, that's happening right now. The Progressive Caucus met last Tuesday. We are working with folks that are trying to push the act to invest in our community. We are meeting with a wide group of people. I met with the governor last Tuesday, went through my list. He had his list. He's helping us, and we are trying to move forward. Now, we don't have a lot of time. The House budget comes out first week of April. We'll be voting on it sometime towards the end of April. My best case scenario is that we're, we're, we are able to put together enough votes to do it during this year's, uh, so it would be the, the uh, last week of April in the budget. We want to do it in the budget. Let me explain sort of the, the theory here. I explained some of these members have never had a tax vote. Some of these members are from relatively moderate districts or conservative districts. If you put it in the budget, if you put the solution as part of the budget, there are other good things in the budget that they would support and would not vote against, even though those revenue provisions are in there. I hope that makes sense. So that's the plan. I'm going to vote to raise your taxes if I can. I hope you don't hate me. No. <laughs> I get this newsletter every every couple of weeks from uh, a, a regional school in the area, and it had this had this quote in it today. Life is not about weathering storms. Life is about dancing in the rain. And and I said, oh yeah, you know, that's a wonderful quote. And I said, I like to dance, and <laughs> I could dance in the rain. But you know what? I'm tired of dancing in the rain. I want to solve this problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Prokop, and thank you for the sobering words. You know, we have about 175 people in this room tonight who, for some of us, we've heard this kind of story in other years, but in other ways. And when we first got together with Elizabeth and Marjorie and discussed having this forum, we were kind of excited. We thought, great, we've got two possibilities at the state legislature. We can really see some excitement. And then we realized what was going on in our own community and how difficult that was going to be this year. And so I know that many of you are here tonight because you want to ask questions to Representative Kokot or you may have some comments. But we've got not enough time and lots and lots of voices. So first, I just want to see a raise of hand. How many of you are students in Northampton schools? So can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Especially on a snow day, because we know how hard you were, bu how busy you were at home doing all your homework today. <laughs> so thanks for coming out. And um, how many of you are parents? Just raise your hand. Yeah, go. Lots of parents. Great. And how many city employees? Any city employees? Lots of city employees. And how many of you are here for the first time at a Yes Northampton forum and thought, wait a minute, how, how do I get here? Great. So you're the people I want to talk to right now. There is a sign-up sheet going around. And I can assure you, and Pam and Joel can tell you the same thing, we will not inundate, nor will we sell your email to anyone else, but we will give you the groundbreaking sort of up-to-date information. Those of you who have been on our mailing list know that. So please, I don't know who has that clipboard, but great, right here. So make sure you sign. You know, if you can make a few bucks on my email address, go ahead. <laughs> we'll hand it over to David. Yes, thank you, Pete. Good idea. So we'll, we'll take that into consideration. So what we'd like to do tonight is um, ask you to please raise your hand. And um, we're not asking for people to make a long speech. As you can tell, there's too many of us here. But we know that uh, many people have questions or concerns. So please, we'd love to get to as many people as possible. And students also, feel free to raise your hands. I'll try to find you. So who'd like to begin? we got a student right here. So if you could just say your name, that would be helpful. Hi, I'm Emma. I know some of you. Um, tonight we've talked a lot about revenue and money and statistics, 
most of which I've understood, some not so much. But can we step back a second and just think about the people and whose lives are affected by the teacher cuts? Miss Williams is not only an amazing band and jazz band teacher, she is an amazing mentor. And who in the right mind would cut her? We, we can't do this. So. <laughs> many, many people who is going to do whatever it takes to get Miss Williams her job back. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Hi, I'm Andrea Gito and I am a parent of two students in Northampton. I'm also a teacher in the Northampton Public Schools. And my question is, I understand the need for more revenue statewide. But I also understand that there are many, many communities in this state that are not facing the huge cuts that we've faced in Northampton year after year after year. And part of that, it's my understanding, and I'm not an economics major, but um, it's my understanding that there's the, the way the funding works has given us a shortfall in Northampton for a very long time. And so my concern is that, and I'm fully in support of the plans that are coming forward to raise revenue statewide, but I still feel concerned, and, and Pamela mentioned this earlier, that even when we raise revenue statewide, we're still going to have a shortfall here in Northampton. And what can we do to change the formulas that devastate, have devastated our state for a really long time? When you go back in history and look at when the formula was originally passed, it was during a gubernatorial campaign, and the state was faced with a lawsuit in terms of how schools were actually funded. The work that was done in that formula was done very, very quickly. Didn't address, uh, didn't address uh, special ed. Didn't address voc ed and was basically targeted towards the neediest districts, the Holyoke, Springfields, Brockton, Boston, et cetera. And what we are facing today is sort of the hangover from that process and from what the aims are. Were those goals good? Yes, because in those days, those urban schools were, uh, those communities were spending so little on their students that's what led to the, the uh, lawsuit. Now we're at a point where some boats have risen, but many communities have not. And the problem is, when you go into changing that formula, some people benefit, some people don't. So by increasing, by, by tweaking it and changing things so that Northampton benefits, it takes away from other communities. The only way to do that is to have enough revenue to hold everyone harmless for that year so that, so that everybody gets raised. By raising, by passing the act, we can, we'll have enough revenue to have the, have the breathing room to actually address those problems with the formula. Someone else? Pam mentioned that one of the proposal, maybe the governor's proposal, wouldn't actually result in any more education funding for Northampton. Does your proposal for the progressive tax reform bring us more revenue for next year? When you look at Governor Patrick's um, plan, he raises the income tax to 6.25 and does a substantial cut in the sales tax. Out of the $2 billion that he wants to raise, only 6% comes from those two moves. The rest of it comes from those, those tax breaks. The problem is that if you look at the 44 tax breaks, I'll bet virtually every family <coughs> in this room takes advantage of them. And so the Act Bill um, deals with that very, very differently and really um, increases the, um, the exemptions for um, low income and middle class families and shifts the tax burden to the, to the folks that we would call wealthy. 500000 per year and over. And so it's our hope that by 
doing it that way, we're going to be able to make it a little bit better in terms of Chapter 70 and and the way. So that's your bill versus the bill? That's the bill that I'm the co-sponsor for. And what's the number of the bill? Um, do you have it? I don't have the number, sorry. So we have to push for your bill to right. get funding for Northampton's education. Well, I think what's going to happen, this is our goal, that we're going to take the best parts of all of these proposals, come up with one proposal, and that's the one that, that we'll push. It's 2553. But, but what, the way that we're approaching it right now is we're basically just trying to do, you know, very simple principles when we're talking to folks. Um, and, you know, and these are them. What are we those are proud? Sure. <laughs> The Progressive Caucus is committed to a major increase in new revenues on the order of $2 billion beginning this year. We suggest that the majority of these new funds come from an increased income tax rate with sufficient personal exemptions to avoid impacting those who have the least ability to pay. The new revenue should be targeted primarily towards transportation and education needs and initiatives, as you have suggested. So how do we make that happen? Pray that I'm successful in this effort with those 23 members of the house. You know, praying is no, probably not going to do it. No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> I think that if you if you um, look at the organizing work that's happening right now, would you like to talk about the act a little bit? And yeah, and then I wanted to also yeah. give some more information on the funding formula. Um, so. She's with the MTA. Um, one of the things that we are doing is at every forum we're at, we are talking about this. Um, if I'm talking with the MMA, if I'm talking with a school group in Southampton, and basically it's it's you folks talking with your friends and neighbors, convincing them that this is what we have to do. That's really, it, 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 these types of forums are happening everywhere. The MTA is meeting with every legislator, <coughs> having the same conversation. I already had my meeting. Yeah, I know. You're awesome. We love you. Um, so my name is Nancy Stenberg. I am the librarian here at JFK, and I also work part-time for the MTA as a legislative organizer so that we can have lots of face-to-face -face meetings with um, you know, the representatives and senators. And just to give you some more concrete information on the funding formula, in the last legislative cycle, the MTA offered a bill to have a study committee to study the formula. All we wanted was $250,000, but we didn't get it. So we're asking for the same thing again in this legislative session. Again, it's not a quick fix. Your quick fixes, I'm afraid, are going to have to go back locally to your poor mayor here. Um, but we're asking to have this funding formula looked at. And as the representative said, you know, once we start looking at it, there's communities who are hugely benefiting from this who aren't going to be happy about it. But, you know, that formula has been in place since 1993, and everything has changed. So in addition to asking your representatives and senators to, you know, pass an act to invest in our communities, please ask them to also pass um, the, I forget what the bill exactly is called, but it's to study the funding, education funding formula. Because if we can just get that going and get that moving along with, you know, revenue enhancement, then that will fix the problem down the road. One of the, one of the uh, source of information on what that realignment of aid would be in terms of if we had more money, how that would work out. The uh, Federal Bank of Boston, uh, on their website, uh, they have a, a number of uh, policy papers. And two years ago, they actually did a, uh, a, a, a model what that would look like if, in fact, the education funding system got 100 million, 200 million, or 300 million, and what that would mean for, for all of our communities. So there is really technical work already out there that's already been done that looks at um, communities like Northampton that have um, relatively high need, some wealth, but have not benefited from the, from the formula in the past. So a lot of that work is already done. So if people are interested in e either of those pieces of legislation, we would be happy to send you out an email to kind of just capture, capture some of the more important things and then what to do about it. 
Would that be helpful? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We'll be happy to do it. How about in the back? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, just with regard to the question of Deborah Kaish Poland, um, I'm a parent uh, of one child in public school and one to be entering public school in a couple of years. Um, the question with regard to the funding formula for education is that does that formula include this? I'm just confused a little bit about which part of the formula addresses charter school. Um, funding because I think you know a large part of what we're hearing um, about our expenses and public education here is the, the huge amounts of tuition that we pay to charter schools, which is increasing every year. And so I'm just curious about whether if a re-examination of that funding formula will include kind of a rethinking about how charter schools. Are. Yes, and. and yeah. As part of that. <coughs> law that passed back in 1983 when the formula was originally um, put forth. When charter schools were proposed, the sort of the trade-off was that charter schools are going to be this great experiment, and the public schools are going to go into these experimental schools, and they were going to learn all this stuff and bring it back to public schools and improve the public schools, and that's why it was going to be so worthwhile for this money to follow students into these schools. The problem, though, is, um, you know, when that money follows that student, you're taking it out of the public school. So the solution to that is to hold public schools harmless. And the only way to do that is to raise enough revenue to make that happen. And so that's the most, I think, the most important part of the whole public. Someone else? Michael, in the back. Um, my name is Michael Holroyd. I have a school to here in the eighth grade, and I also work for a substitute teacher here. And I've been involved with this you know, back to 206, 207. We've gone through this year after year, some years more intensely. You know, in 2009, the headline was 48 teachers have to be cut. And we worked on an override. And that was the year I was on the strategic planning committee that was set up by the class superintendent. I remember the consultants who ran that said 209 is when the stock market was going down. Uh, there's no possibility of an override. And we proved them completely wrong by That's getting right. like 59.9% yes mm -hmm. right. in those hard economic times. But my, I, I should stop making a speech because I just want to communicate it isn't just we're all here concerned. I think there's a reservoir of deep anger that has been building up over years about this situation, and I personally see what some of the individuals here at this school go through, some of the teachers who put their heart and soul into their work, and year after year they have to worry and are anxious, and it just, you know, students pick up on this, students are upset, they go to the high school, we watch that, that wonderful performance by on Annie at the weekend, and I see this, the, the corridors full of signs that students put up, don't break our hearts, save the arts. Anyway, I have a, not to make a speech, I have a specific Michael, question. question. I do have a question. <laughs> and it's the only question we've had so far about the expense side. And I'm only going, I haven't been so involved this year so far, but I read that the schools are short 1.4 million. And I'm only going on what I've read in the Gazette, and then I hear, well, 1.4 million is the in potential increase in our health coverage. And I say to myself, look, Amherst is facing a huge problem as well. They've had to cut people. And there may be other communities. So why on earth can't we get together? And I don't even know if we have the health, same health insurance. But isn't it time that we said as a community, OK, you want to charge 1.4 million more for just this year? Goodbye. You know? Enough. And if enough communities say this together, you know, it's time we get these health care costs. They understand. They can't just raise these costs. And some of these cost raises are not justified in any way whatsoever. It's a for-profit kind of business. So, you know, 1.4 million short in schools, 1.4 million increase in health care. For goodness sake, can't we do something to at least, because one year, when Claire, the mayor, said we have the, you know, a big deficit, we're going to lay off teachers, she managed to get the health coverage down. <coughs> Why can't we do this, not on a yearly basis, but for the next two or three years? <coughs> Thank you, Michael. I'm going to actually ask our mayor if he could just speak for a moment. So, um, you're right, health care has been one of the biggest drivers of our budget, um, and it's one of the things I've been talking about at our budget forum. It's not exactly 1.4. The, the renewal quote is about 
a little over $1 million, but clearly a significant amount. Um, I will say, and we're going to be convening a meeting of our insurance advisory commission <coughs> committee very soon, which is to talk with all the employees about it. I will tell you that um, I could say goodbye, help New England, we don't want to do business with you anymore, but no one else has quoted on our business. Not a single other, we put it out to bid to all of the other insurers, no one else will quote on our business. So we're really having to look at, um, at other, at other uh, measures, including looking at the state uh, GIC plan, which we, uh, I asked the city council to adopt the new health insurance reform act last year, they did. So we're going to be trying to look at some other creative things. Um, but you're right, health care is one of those big cost drivers. But it's not just Northampton. I mean, it's happening in, in municipalities across the state. So that is a number we have to contain and try to get down. Um, but we have to provide health insurance coverage to our employees. And, uh, and uh, you know, it hasn't, we don't have single payer. Uh, we still have to operate in the environment that we operate in. And so th this is what we're left with, is going out to bid and trying to get those costs down. Um, and, I, and again, our employees have worked to try to work with us to try to change co-pays and change design of the plan as much as we can, but we've kind of run out of tricks in terms of what we can do there. Uh, and so now we're having to look at alternative methods. So that's kind of the short answer on that. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Minette. I'm a parent of a high school student, and, uh, I'm a middle school student. And uh, my understanding <coughs> from the budget meeting last night was that it sounded like we really needed to have an override. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is that if we can somehow get the act through, it would give us enough revenue here in Northampton that we may not need an override. So I just want to clarify. Do we, do, do we need both? Do we need one to, get, I don't to, keep, think, to keep our schools? Our I don't think I specifically said that I knew that the passage of the act would directly correlate into having exactly enough money to meet all of our campus needs. What I think I'm saying is that if we don't do it, we're definitely not going to have enough money to meet your needs. In terms of what the mayor is able to uh, uh, recommend in terms of uh, health care reform and Looking at you know his operations, um, um, I don't know what that gap is, and I don't think <coughs> you're going to know for a, a, a period of time. Um, all I'm focusing on right now is trying to get that through, so that there will be some more resources, and I'll do my best as part of that act to make sure that the language gives Northampton the maximum amount. <coughs> um, but short of reforming the the <coughs> formula this year. Um, that's a long-term solution. It's not going to happen this year, but it will happen relatively soon after if we can get that amount of revenue. So, so I don't know if that answered your, your question completely. I think there, I think both solutions are moving on parallel paths, and we're not at the point yet where you can make that choice. Go ahead. Don't sit down, Peter. Got a question? I wasn't sitting. I was turning. <laughs> My name is Dave Murphy. I'm chairman of the City Council Finance Committee. And I want to let you know that I have a great deal of empathy for the cuts that are going to affect the schools and for every other city department. <coughs> the problem is that municipalities in Massachusetts are not particularly economically viable. We're in a nasty cycle where our, where our expenses go up 5 or 6% a year, and the increases in our primary <coughs> sources of revenue, our property taxes, by statute only can increase half of that. We had an override three years ago. We've been okay, now we hit the wall. It will happen again, because our sources of revenue are property taxes. Um, we get vehicle excise taxes, we get meals taxes, we get hotel occupancy taxes. But many of our taxes, hotel occupancy, meals, and cop rights at Chapter 90 ticket, we split with the Commonwealth, so we don't get to keep all of that money. So we're always behind the eight ball. And I would like to know, why the Commonwealth doesn't give us the capacity to generate the revenue within our own borders to meet our needs. Because over and over and over again, we hit this wall every couple of years where our income constraints don't let us feel, fill our needs. And they're realistic needs. they are contractual increases with our employees, their health care, their fuel costs. Everybody knows their costs go up. And yet we are constrained in our income. And I'm wondering why is the answer to send money to Boston to hope that it comes back here? 
Right. Why doesn't the Commonwealth give us the capacity to generate the revenue within our borders to be a viable community and do the business we need to do? Councilor, as you know. <laughs> Councilor, as you know, every time the city of Northampton, the city council, and its mayor has sent a home rule petition to Boston <coughs> to allow the city of Northampton to raise funds locally, I have not only voted for it, but I have gotten it passed every time. The city of Northampton sends me a home rule petition sponsored by you or any other councilor who's here asking for that power. I will do my best to get it passed, and I've got 100% this is a this problem point. that isn't unique to us. Right. Cities and towns across Massachusetts have this problem. Every representative, every senator has communities that are behind the eight ball like us. It, we shouldn't have to individually home rule to be equal partners in government. What? I would like right. to think that the legislature would say, you are equal partners in government, we're going to give you the ability to raise the revenue you need to meet the needs of your citizens within your community, rather than have to to come to the Commonwealth and say, hey, give us some aid. Because we're a healthy city. We're not in failure. Right. You know, people, you're not having to take over our schools because we're not doing a good job. Right. Let me tell you a tale of a meeting I was at two Fridays ago. The MMA, which is the overarching organization that represents <coughs> every city and town in Massachusetts, has legislative forums. They break it up. Into, into areas, I think uh, ours was in Waverly, so all the selectmen and, the, and the, uh, all, the, all the various boards from all the towns in that area were actually there. I talked about raising revenues and taxes and the history of our problems, and I asked for a poll. I asked all these elected officials to raise their hands if they were prepared to vote for additional revenues. Out of that entire room, and it was packed. I would say 20% of the people raised their hands. We passed the meals tax, the local option meals tax bill. Every community in Massachusetts was given the, the option of having a local option meals tax. There are still, still communities in this valley that have not adopted it. There were mayors, not this mayor, but there were mayors that asked <laughs> legislators to pass that law. <coughs> that said, I can't support it myself, but if you pass it and the council does it, I'll, I, I'll spend those revenues. So this particular city council <laughs> may be in favor of that, but what I'm saying to you is, if you get outside of Northampton, Cambridge, Newton, some parts of Boston, and Wellesley, and Amherst, of course, the philosophy that you are espousing, and just the mere support for additional taxes, and the, and the thought of, of raising someone's taxes and come up and coming up with with uh, new revenues, the support is not as great. So, as I said, you send me a home rule, I get a pass. Well, I would pay if I knew it stay here, but the only thing we can do is override. The property tax increases only hit less than half of the citizens of Northampton, and that seems unfair. So, if you would give us some more tools. Maybe we could do it. Send me a home rule. What would be the kind of things that, what would be the type of thing, have you passed any lately? Has the legislature adopted any local revenue measures lately? I mean, I, I can't think of any. Uh, no, because we haven't gotten any home like rules. A, like a sushi towns. tax for North no. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, what, you know, what is it? What could we do that would be the good? Let us keep more things that we're sharing. Let us keep more meals. Let us keep more meals. <coughs> I mean, That's we great. generate them from here. Give us a better percentage of that. I'm in favor of all of that. We just have time. I know a number of people have to get home, and stuff, so we just have time for a couple more questions. So this man looks like he's ready to go. My name is uh, Dick Connor, and I live in Northampton, born here, been here for 80 years. Some people maintain, <coughs> you talked about the insurance premium. I've worked for the federal government for about 25 years, and all that while the federal government who has all the money, only pays, uh, the employee of the government pays 60% of their, pardon me, 40% of their insurance premiums. The federal government pays the other 60. All these years, all the state employees, city employees, received 100%. Not as much. Actually, it's not true. Probably not now. I realize it's gone down. 
but all the state employees received 100%. If there's anybody that works here for the state, this may be uh, something new to them, but there's, there's, no, there's many people in our society that do not get uh, uh, the percentage of premiums for insurance. Why should people that work for the education system or for anybody else, why do they <coughs> deserve it? All many of these other people are working on very difficult jobs. They don't get it. So if, even if it was cut down some, it's no great big deal. When we have a, uh, we're talking about the governor, this Mr. Murphy is talking about, the villain he maintains is the legislature. I've maintained that for years. We have had very good people, very nice guys and ladies in the legislature. But they're villains as a group. <laughs> they are not, that's true. This, they're, they're telling you exactly what, we, what you can do. Back a few years ago, I fought against the CPA tax. The state promised three, they were promised uh, if we collected 3%, they would pay the matching. All of a sudden, two years later, the state remained. They're not paying it. Now our governor in the past came out publicly and he wants to tax kids soda. Now they got away with that a number of years ago, taxing kids ice cream cones. Now he would like to pull that back because that was the dizziest thing I ever heard of in my life. Connor, I'm going to ask you, we're going to run out okay. of time. Okay, okay. So, but, uh, yeah, so and like to, not to uh, criticize the man, but you've got to do something about the legislature. <coughs> Yeah. This, this the, uh, can I just <laughs> give a couple of comments? Yes. Those villains that you're talking about have enacted the most rich array of benefits for veterans, Gold Star mothers, and families of veterans in the entire country. So when you call the legislature villains, look at any veteran that's here <coughs> and talk to any veteran's family, here. and you will be told that thank God for Massachusetts, we're taking care of them. Thank Great. You. Thank you. If, Thank if you I might just to counteract that in one moment, I happen to be a veteran, and I have five brothers that are all veterans. And my father was a veteran, and his uncles were veterans. Thank you. I maintain the federal government should look after the veterans, I'm with you. not the Thank state. You. We I'm got time for one more question. We started with the student. I'm going to see if there are any of the students. Right we got one right here. Okay, and this is, I unfortunately have to say that this is a fantastic discussion. So we're going to have to pull it together. Oh, Thanks. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia Renault. I'm a student here at JFK Middle School, and I'm here for Claire Ann Williams. I have been in the band all three years at JFK, and I have a brother who is extremely excited to get into the band program. My question for my reason for coming here tonight is to figure out what we can do. Like, I just feel helpless. Maybe that's just because I'm a kid. Maybe it's just because I don't know what to do. But I just don't know how we can fix this. I mean, is the bill just a temporary solution, or can we do anything more? Thank you. Just, um, as I mentioned, this is a political battle. This is a campaign. You have to convince people. You have to, you have to be a lobbyist. Yeah. And you have to lobby your family members, your relatives, your neighbors. And when you're talking to people and they say to you, we don't need revenues, try to explain some of the facts that you heard tonight. That, that's what you can do. With that. That's a great help to me. Thank you, Representative. And thank you so much. Thank you all. And I'm so sorry we can't get to everybody. We're going to actually move into the, the next section, and Pam's going to talk a little bit about what we can do. Yes. So you're... Excellent question, and um, and I'm happy to bring us to that action. And um, like the representative said, we're talking about parallel tracks here. We we need to uh, well basically say thank you, Representative Hocott, for your leadership. We are incredibly fortunate to have someone who is leading the charge. You, let's just all notice that that you know. We could be having a legislative meeting saying, you must do this, and instead we're here to say thank you, and it's amazing. And, and so that's number one, is to continue to support you. 
And I know, let me also just add, Senator Rosenberg had every intention to be here. He was actually going to go so far. He's in Boston. He needs to be in Boston today and tomorrow. He was going to drive back and forth tonight. That's, and that was the level of his commitment, and he was not able to because of the roads and the, the, the weather. That sort of got in the way of a two-hour <coughs> trip that could have turned into eight hours. But he was very explicit with me in sending regards to all of you and saying that he is prepared to uh, continue the debate in the Senate. If the revenue bills have to start in the House. Um, and that the Senate is having their debates and their talks and will hopefully pick up a mantle that is delivered from the House. Um, so what we need to do on the state level, I wanted to just also let you know that there is a group in its beginning stages. Uh, part, some of us from Yes Northampton are part of it and um, led by uh, the, a UMass-based um, phenom, Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts, that is bringing together other activists from other communities around the state to create a very grassroots um, energy movement for state tax reform. And we're actually co connecting with activists from those communities who have worked on Proposition 2 and have overrides in their communities and are coming up against the same roadblocks and are looking to the state for lasting solutions. We have actually a lobby day planned, the nascent stages, with, uh, on April 9th. Is that the right? So, that notice will be going out on that um, on our uh, Yes Northampton email listserv. By the way, for those who have somehow missed the sign-up sheet, all it takes is an email to yesnorthampton at gmail.com to get connected, and you can, we, we can put you on the email list. So that is happening. Um, we will continue to inform you through the representative of things that we can do here to help push the state tax legislation forward. I think that... Is yes. the lobby day something students participate in? Uh, absolutely, and I, 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 I yes, it's, um, it's on a school day. <laughs> that doesn't need to be any barrier. Um, and, um, um, and again, students, get on the email list. That's what I want to say. Yes, Northampton at gmail.com. Be connected. Direct line of action. Um, absolutely. Come one, come all. If you, um, and we haven't quite, you know, the, again, we are, this is our first time where we're gathering activists from other communities. We, if I would say, come join us and be part, close up to a growing, move, a beginning of a movement. That's that's the true characterization of where we're at. Um, so, it is also I think it's become clear, um, and check. I mean, I, well, it has become clear that we have no state guarantee. We cannot go into these next weeks thinking that we have a state guarantee that we are going to avoid these local budget cuts, which I know brought many of you out here today. Um, that's a reality that's worth registering as we continue to push very fiercely for state tax reform. Um, so it is also clear that um, we are going to, well, what is also, what we'll also know is in the next couple of weeks we'll have a clearer picture of our revenue situation locally. I know the mayor's working very intensely on our health insurance costs right now. You've heard about that. We're going to have more information. Um, if I had to gander a guess, um, I would say that we are not going to, I'm, uh, this is a guess, and I am, I'm, whether I'm a city councilor or, or a parent of three kids in the school system or a Yes Northampton activist, I'm talking in any and all hats, but my guess is that we're not going to be able to stop these cuts without an override. That's my guess, okay? It is a guess, it is not, and there's no official declaration, there's no official, there's a process for this, it has to go through the city council, it has to be voted on, it has to be crafted, what it is, what, you know, the, and you can't begin to craft what that override would be made of um, until you know what the budget gap is with greater certainty and what we need to fill it. So, so I am really, I'm sort of taking a leap here by saying that it's just my personal logic is that to stop the kinds of cuts that the kind of things that you guys are talking about and that you know there's there's people there's students organizing in the school system right now over that I I think we're looking at that likelihood and so this is going to be uh, something that will unfold for us in the coming weeks the clarity and what it will take what we it will take as a community to come together to ensure that these massive harmful, long-term damaging cuts to our school system and our city services do not happen. It will take every one of us in this room times 10. And the great news in the face of the inherently uphill battle, because the property tax is a measure of last resort, it is a regressive tax, it's not one we're proud 
to pass. We are desperate to pass in view of the trade-off. If we come to that, that's what it's made of. It's made of the alternative is far worse. And so it will take this kind of a, a, an education campaign, a, a voice to voice, door to door, students, if we go there, if we need to go there, and you wonder what to do, wonder no more. There is, there is so much to do to reach out to our community and to explain the stakes. And the good news is we have a history that we can draw on where we're, we, we were in terrible times, as Michael was talking about, up against all odds, and we did come together as a community and we said this is what our community is worth to us, the health of it, the future of it, our children, our safety, our libraries, this is what it's worth to us, and we uh, surprised everyone, and I will confess, including ourselves, and won 60% of the vote. So it, we did it, we did it, in very challenging circumstances. And if we have to, we will do it again. And we will do it all together. And we will build community in the process. And we will demonstrate what it takes to really preserve this great city. So just stay tuned. Stay connected. Get on the Yes Northampton email list. And we'll work together and solve this budget crisis. Say special, we, we I want to say special thanks to Elizabeth Silver and to Marjorie Hess of the Northampton Democratic City Committee. They were the inspiration. They were the inspiration. They reached out to Yes Northampton and say, "Hey, let's and said, let's do this." And so, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Representative Cocott, for being so responsive to us. And they really, I guess I want to say, as a colleague of Mayor Nark, was as a friend, as a neighbor, as we are so incredibly lucky to have this man at the helm of our city. So he is there are, there, are remaining, there are remaining budget forums that you can go to to hear directly, just directly, how lucky we are because of what he is offering to us for information and, um, and for just basically our foundation as we go forward and face these next few weeks. There is one tomorrow night. My budget for you, will, he goes through the budget, and I know I see familiar faces even from last night's um, forum at, at Bridge Street, so thank you for showing up two nights in a row, and if you didn't get to last night, you can get to tomorrow night at North, Northampton High School at 7 p.m. He will really give you the nuts and bolts in a way that really brings home on a local level how we got here, and then subsequent dates, April 1st? First and third. First, April 1st and third. April 1st is? Uh, Florence Community, uh, Ryan Road. Ryan Road. And then Florence Community Center on the 3rd. April 3rd. Would, would those be the places to talk more about the override? Because in what, and I, I, I noticed this isn't really a question, but it's a concern. I, I agree. I think we are looking at, at probably an override. And what? how quickly would that need to get going to have it be realistically something that could happen before June? Or, I mean, what? Do you want to I. Okay. I, let me just say this. Either one. I mean, we have enough time. We okay. have enough time. We have. We, we are absolutely certain that if we need this, we have enough time. And so. And again, we wouldn't. We just. We don't want to get the cart before the horse. We want to be super clear about what our budget numbers look like. But we have enough time to get clear and to assess and come to a decision as a council and get it on a ballot if we need to. We have enough time. There are, uh, I'm an arts educator, I have been for 25 years. There are lots of people out there who say, okay, um, Northampton is great. They've got a great band program, great theater program, but if we cut it, we'll be fine. And what I don't think people, some people understand is that if we cut the programs and in selling another proposition two and a half, if we say, well, yeah, we can cut those programs, but you know what? Now the class size at JFK is going to be, instead of an average of 18, now all those kids who are in all those programs doing all those great things, now the class size is going to be 32 in a classroom where it was 18. Now there will not be <coughs> jazz band. Now there will not be, because the, the music educator, who probably would end up getting two pieces of half a job, is running from one building to another. And so the quality, 
that we have come to love and wonder about completely goes. But I think for people in this room, we understand the importance of the arts, we understand the importance of teachers and quality education, but trying to sell it to those who maybe don't understand or would question, why do I need to pay yet another tax? Is that a possibility? Well, it, that goes to um, effective campaign strategy, effective information, and, you know, that goes to why we need everybody times 10 in the room to get out there and ex explain to those who need explaining. I will tell you that if we organize every single parent in the school system and their neighbors, you know, wh whether or not their parents or not, we, 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 we can do this. So, in other words, I would not worry about that right now. I would worry about connecting people who you already know understand the importance of these things, connecting them to yesnorthampton at gmail.com. That's where I would focus. Because that's, that's, and the other thing I want to say, because I know there's many of you that might be showing up at the school committee, at the city council meeting for public comment, at the school committee meeting for public comment, fantastic. Show up, you know, express your concern, have your voice be heard. And I want to, I want to offer this piece of input that standing in front of school committee members of the city council and saying these cuts are awful, that, I mean, that's a fine opening statement. That's a good launch. We all agree they're awful. But the finger wagging about don't cut this, we arts are vital, we need to just say, you know, you need to save, focusing exclusively on one budget item, arts in the high school versus language in the middle school versus the elementary school teacher in the elementary school level. This, I want to suggest to you that this is not productive, that this is, a, that is feeding into the divide and conquer, it's trying to rank education at different levels, it doesn't serve our cause of a unity around a quality public education, education system from elementary to high school. Every single component of, this, of, of our learning system, obviously one feeds into the other. I don't think I need to convince you how vital it all is. We all have kids that have gone through different stages. I just want to say the messaging around, uh, around what it is that we need to do, it is about revenue. It's about revenue. These school committee members are sickened by what they're a party to. I know, I bet I, many of you know that I see I see our school committee member, Howard Moore. I don't know if I, there are other school committee Stephanie members. Who? Stephanie. Oh, Stephanie Pitt, yes. All right, I mean, I, mean, I know I'm not you know, going out on a limb to say how absolutely devastating it is to be a part of this and to be faced with this. So just know, oh, well, I'm sorry, Pitt School Committee Blue Development. <laughs> so just know your audience and that we're all in this together. There is no enemy except the lack of revenue. And we need to together figure out how we get it. <laughs> Schmooze, if you like. I think there was a few cookies back there. I don't know what's left, but thank you so much for turning out.